Daniel T Scott Tisdall, thanks so much uh, for doing this interview with me. Sure. And uh, you, I see like this, you know, wonderful um, array of books behind you. And, and so one thing I, I, I actually took all the books out of my office because yeah. I found their presence either distracting um, or crushing, like soul crushing, because whatever I was working on was just not as good as those books uh, or it just was less appealing. And, you know, I found they were stealing my attention away. Yeah. Um, so I actually moved all the books out of my office and put them in, on another floor of the house. <laughs> <laughs> and the only books I have in the office now are right beside my little area where I write. I've got the other books I've written, like and published, oh. so that if if when it's really like a slog, I can look at these books and think, no, I I have done this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do yeah. know how to do this thing. Um, but maybe I can get you to introduce yourself by just saying like how you kind of see yourself. I don't know, in relation to those books. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if you've read my biography, but these are actually all my books. <laughs> this, is, this is my life's Napa work God. so far. You know, I slowed down a little bit in the last few years. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, part of the reason that, that I ha have the books here is partly a necessity because half of them were stored on my parents' farm in Saskatchewan, which they sold two years ago. Mm. Uh, so that meant I had to, to find a new home for them. Um, and I also like having them because... Uh, it does make a nice icebreaker or even conversation starter with students when they come by. I always forget how scary office hours can be uh, for students because I don't feel like a, a scary person, but, but I obviously understand that. And so I find that that's often a good way something catches someone's eye and they're like, oh, I read that or I've always wanted to read that. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of the books that I keep, I, I of course have them, you know, fiction, poetry, all, all sort of anally alphabetized. And I have my art books and, 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 and comics and things like that at the top. And those are often the books that I go to when I'm writing and I'm stuck and I just need an image to kind of get me going. So sure. I try to use it. To, I do get that soul crushing thing you're saying. Absolutely. But I also do try to use it for inspiration. Well, I actually, maybe I've done it really poorly thought out plan. But in my university office uh, at the University of Manitoba, I put I took all the books that I haven't yet read. I actually separated them out from the books I've, I own and keep. You know, I've been very, I'm trying to be very selective with what I, books I keep now. Yeah. So I was very indiscriminate for many years. And uh, after so many moves, it just, uh, it just started, it was like, I'm just going to stop keeping books. Yeah. That, uh, you know, especially books I'll never read again. But I've got all these books I haven't read. And they're, you know, often, you know, books I'm excited to read. They're great books, yeah. but it would take me years to read through them all. So I actually moved them off. I felt like, anxiety because I hadn't read them so like especially in my writing office yeah you know, I felt like here's all this undone work these yeah unread books <laughs> I moved them physically off onto the university campus and so my office is all books I haven't read yeah. so when students come like it looks like this like wall that. this display of you know intelligence and authority but I've, yeah. I've read none of those books yeah I love that yeah so anyway, um, speaking of more specific books, you've got The Writing Moment, yes. the textbook that you wrote recently, which is what I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, it's a really excellent book. You know, well, thanks, Jonathan. I, I've been looking a long time for a book that I can use as a textbook in creative writing. And what I, what I find consistently is, um, I think I mentioned it to you before, I ha there's this problem that I see with writing textbooks, which is either that they're aimed too low, like at a, at a really beginner writer who very quickly will move beyond that book. Yeah. And in many ways should be reading articles and not these books. Right. Um, or they're aimed at a kind of very high kind of pitch, you know, so you're reading the way I kind of describe it sometimes to people is you either are reading like an article on how to get rid of adverbs yeah. that's been expanded into a book uh, or you're reading Derrida. And yeah. there's this very yeah. small, you know, or Deleuze or something like this. Yeah. And there's a very small kind of, space in between where I don't find many books exist, probably for marketing reasons. Right. Um, ironically, you know, you have this kind of weird how to write industry that to me has kind of made the, uh, I guess a, a sort of mistake and maybe a non money making <laughs> sense. Like I'm sure it makes sense from a money making perspective, but there's a sort of weird mistake where it seems to me like a lot of the books about how to write are addressed to people who will never write uh, yeah. consistently. Uh, or people who very much need something more complicated than that book. Yeah. Um, when, so what I really loved about the writing moment, because I find this is especially a problem with poetry. So 
even when you do find a book about poetry that's very craft focused and practically focused, it will avoid the theoretical ideas that that writers play with. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, or you'll kind of again, you'll often won't. And the other thing is, even when you do find a very strong poetry craft book, it'll be extremely conservative. Right. Um, it may be good, but it, you'll often be very conservative, and you won't really get a sense of the the real just range of writing that you can yeah. do. So, what I really liked about the writing moment was, you're pitching it in some ways at a beginner writer who is very serious. Yeah. Uh, and also, you're talking. You'll like you'll go from you know showing student work and talking about like what students have done to, you know, having, here's a poem by Frank O'Hara. Here's a poem, you know, yeah. by, here's a, here's something that Shakespeare had done. Uh, here's a sonnet, you know, these traditional sort of ways of working. Here's, you know, how to, to write a blank verse. Uh, and then you will discuss Zizek. You do discuss Deleuze and Guattari, you know, yeah. uh, but in a very comprehensible way. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, it seems like it's an interesting tightrope, and I'm wondering, um, so I'm going to get kind of back to that in a second, but one thing I wanted to just sort of ask you was how did you actually come up to write uh, this book? Yeah, I mean, there's sort of, I guess, kind of two phases to that because there was, yeah, the first of all, like sitting down to write a book on, on how to write poetry, which needless to say had never, ever crossed my mind. But we were actually having a meeting in, in my office here a few years ago, uh, the Creative Writing Group meets once a week here and it's open to the creative writing students to any student former student who just wants to come hang out and we happen to be having a really big meeting that day I mean we must have had 20 some people squeezed into my little office um, and there was a very quiet student reading who, who was very funny but we were all listening very closely and we heard a, just a gentle knock on the door and you could tell it was a sort of knock that someone was like, oh, wait, is there someone in there? I'm not sure. I don't want to knock on a door. With it. And, and so the student who's closest to the door opened it up. And, and this person who knocked on the door uh, almost, you know, we're, we're, we're up a, a level, almost literally like fell off, you know, and fell like a story to, to, her, to her demise. Um, and it turned out it was the acquisitions editor for Oxford University Press. And uh, she she didn't want to interrupt the, the meeting, but she basically said she's here is something they need and are interested in, and, and so would I do it? Um, and I thought no, but I said but I said <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? The way you always you always say yes to everything at, at the university. And then and then the next step, of course, is the sort of how how the book as I as I did it came about was just looking at a whole bunch of, of sort of how to write poetry books and books that are multi-genre with, with a poetry component. And, and two things struck me. The first is, is what you've already said, that, that yes, it, you do need to give students these, these traditional elements. Um, but at the same time, there's all these other possibilities. And, and, you know, you have a creative writing classroom, and everyone who does knows all the different things that the people in that room want to do. And so I, I wasn't seeing that in any of the books. And I also wasn't seeing books that were that were really getting students writing a lot and and so that when I when I kind of you know I sold the pitch a book to Oxford and so my little short line was practice precedes abstraction and it was the idea that I would have these little writing moments you know hence the title that would just get the students right so you're writing now I'm telling you some things now I'm telling you something else and you're writing based on that and then when you get to the end of the chapter you could do more kind of traditional exercises so it was once I knew there was a book that I wanted to do then I was really like, okay, like I want to pitch this, and I hope I hope they take it because I would really like to write this book. Sure. And so, when how did you actually start getting into the meat of how you would structure or design the books? Like, so for example, how did you decide or select what techniques you were going to focus on and the kind of types of writing you were going to focus on? Because it's very wide ranging. I mean, you go from, like I say, very traditional forms. Uh, like metrical patterns, uh, yeah. sonnets, of course, um, these enduring forms, but also um, you're talking about comic books. Uh, you're giving, uh, talking about concrete poetry. I've never seen, uh, and maybe it's just uh, my bad luck, but I've never seen a poetry textbook that discusses uh, concrete poetry, uh, like visual poetry of any sort. Yeah. Uh, never mind that, you know, using like references from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to, you know, yeah. Uh, like other com like comic books, uh, and also you know Shakespeare. Uh, yeah, you know, these are very traditional. Yeah, so I definitely poetry. wasn't seeing that either. So that was 
you know, that was one of the main things I, I wanted. And, and that was something that got the Oxford excited as well. You know what I mean? Like that was something when it came back uh, and it was accepted, that was something they said, yes, like, please, please make that a, part, a, a serious part of this book. And so they also came, you know, I was working under some expectations from them and it was sort of like, I'm guessing this is the info that they were getting from creative writing teachers. And it was that they wanted a book that was about writing new poetry, was about revising poetry, and was about ways of, I mean, they're saying publication, but I, 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 I presented more as like ways of sharing poetry because I mean, talk about, you know, cart before the horse or whatever, I mean. Uh, and so I, I did have that kind of model that they gave me. But yeah, as, as I was undertaking it, I mean, I was drawing a lot on, obviously, my experience in the creative writing classroom and, and a lot too, uh, you know, I'm out at UT Scarborough and, and we have a lot of great connections with the community. So I do community outreach, poetry workshops, which are just literally like open to anyone from the community. And, 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 and one of the things that I found on, on, on that front and, and, you know, working with beginning writers here was just how much poets can improve here's what imagery is, here's what the music of poetry is, here's what metaphor is. And you could literally do it in a couple hours and people have suddenly gone from here as writers. And that's kind of what you're talking about. It's like, if your creative writing textbook ends there, then people have read it in a day and they're ready for something else. And they immediately don't need to reread the book. Like yeah. that's what I find a lot of them. Like, because I'm also looking for a book that I could read, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. that like I know what an image is. I know how to create a metaphor, you know, I could get better at it, but how, yeah. like that's the, where I feel a lot of it sort of ends. And so what I liked about the kind of structure that you've come up with was, um, you were, because you were getting into some of these philosophical ideas, you'll talk, you'll talk about the, I, I thought you had a very clever, I don't know how much you had designed it this way, but to me, the patterning seemed to be, you would pick a sort of technique that you're going to teach or to cycle exercises around. And you'd also pick a, a broader kind of philosophical concept by way of illustration. So you'll talk about the sublime uh, and what that is and sort of a bit of the tradition of how it shows up in poetry, both traditionally and in even avant-garde experimental work, you know, how they kind of approach the sublime differently. And then you'll hang very concrete yeah. know, exercise about, you know, here's a type of, I forget the precise thing you talk about with the sublime, but you know, here's a precise type of poem you yeah. can learn to write, uh, but we're going to use these broad concepts. And so, you know, one, you're tapping into the poetic tradition of philosophizing with poetry or through yeah. poetry. Uh, and two, um, you've got a very you know practical thing that these people are doing. Yeah. Um, the yes, that was definitely, I mean, in the, in the, in the introduction, I talk about that, um, about the occasions of poetry that, you know, I give my, my particular example of being at my, my, uh, my partner's, uh, cousin's wedding and, and, and being asked to write a poem kind of on the spot and just use that as a moment to show, you know, beginning writers that it's always a process, but also to show this idea that, yeah, like poems come out of occasions that it's not just an idea. It's also going to be an emotion. It's also going to be a life moment. It's also going to be an artistic motivation. And as you're pointing out, once we have that kind of model in mind, you can then start pointing to specific traditions and start introducing poets to all of these different sort of paths that they can go down on that front. And I think, too, it just gets at, I think, what's key to, to, to teaching this material, and it's, it's putting these things kind of in tension or putting these things in relationship. So, yeah, you're not just doing an image. You're doing an image in relationship to the poem you're forbidden to write. Like, you're not just, you know, you're not just writing about meter you're doing it in relation to the sublime. That, that's one of the first exercises of the poem forbidden to write, if not the first one. And It is, um, yeah. It, I thought that was really, when I saw that, I was sold. Because <laughs> not only you're getting into the emotional aspect of, you know, what is the thing that, you know, personally, in some way, you're forbidden. Uh, I mean, it, it, I think it taps nicely into a kind of emotional level. It also, you get into social taboos and you get this broader level. Um, which you can kind of start to connect to more abstractly to different philosophies. And it's also something that's applicable, as I say, like cross politics. So whatever your kind of, let's say political belief in what poetry is or should be, uh, that's a thing you can tap into. And, it, and it's also crossing you basically out of what you 
would do <laughs> yeah. into the space where you're now doing something you're uncomfortable with. And I've, I've, I feel like that's a strain in the book too, which I really appreciated, you know, this way that from the first exercise, you're really challenging people to do something they wouldn't normally do. Um, and I think that works on the formal level as well. You know, they're trying different approaches. And again, I, I appreciated the way that you crossed um, lines in that sense. Mm. And you've done that in your own practice. I mean, you do a variety of very different types of poetry. Uh, so, so it seemed, you know, really work in a variety of ways. So just to make this all a bit more concrete, like what would be an actual process you should go through? Like how, how would you write in a writing exercise? Like in terms of, uh, forms or types of writing, like how do you actually write a writing exercise? Cause you've got a variety of them in this book and, you know, um, and again, like just, if we're going to talk like shop a little bit yeah. uh, as a writer, uh, who's either going to come up with exercises to pr utilize themselves or, um, as a teacher, you know, yeah. or, you know, which so many writers teach, of course, uh, and, teach creative writing. Uh, I mean, how do you actually go, with, what is the writing process of doing a writing exercise? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, a part of it kind of comes back to what we've, we've sort of touched on and it's, I, I try to have sort of two components that you have the sort of prompt and then you have the sort of practice that you have that aspect of the exercise that's going to stimulate someone's imagination. That's going to make them want to write, you know, that's going to say yes. But then at the same time, that's also giving them some sort of, that he has that pedagogical aspect that's giving them some sort of direction and it's giving them access to this tool or this technique in a way that, that right away they can kind of just go with it. Um, like one that, one that I, that, that I find has, has, has done, uh, you know, led to good poems or, or taken something difficult for students to understand and, 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 and help them write with it uh, is taking the idea of the, of the ideal image of taking, you know, that, that there's another aspect of the image that maybe we don't often talk about in creative writing textbooks, even though it's at the core of kind of all art, you know, the, you know, it, it's there from kind of Plato on this contrast between what is and what could be. Uh, and so it can be a very abstract thing, you know, even, though, even as I'm trying to describe it. Uh, and so the writing exercise that, that I have in the book and that I'd used previously with students just talks about, I was at the butterfly sanctuary and, uh, I saw a woman who was covered in, she had butterfly earrings, butterfly thing, in her bar barrette in her hair, butterfly brooches, butterfly pattern shirt. She was just like the, the woman who loved butterflies. She walked in there and was all in awe and wonder. And then like one butterfly came near her and she's like this. And then another one. And suddenly they were swarming her and she was screaming and having a panic attack and totally had to be, be hauled out of there. And so I give that as this concrete example of, of this meeting between the sort of ideal of what butterflies are and then the sort of real encounter with that. So, you know, for some students, they can just take that and, and write a poem about that, but then it also gives them access. Yeah. What, what are my experiences like that? Or what are other people's sort of encounters with that? So that's, that, that, that's one example uh, that, that I've had success with that, that I think is doing those two things. Sure. So when you find something like that, where again, you know, so let me just ask you a quick, question about that particular example so in that instance did you at that time uh, get compelled to write a poem about these butterfly experience yes so um and then to what degree did you actually connect the exercise to the kind of process that you went through in reality uh no it, it was definitely just the sort the sort of uh, uh beginning point sure for sure yeah sure yeah. so and then when you are trying to kind of pick the technical idea to illustrate uh, with the prompt is that you know the instance where you, you, i mean at what point i guess do, i'm asking like does it become unfocused like how many things could you add to that writing prompt before it's no longer practical does that make sense yeah yeah i know yeah yeah i know what you mean i mean that's definitely something i i struggled with and i mean you know especially where you know, so as I said, the book is divided into, into writing moments and writing exercises. You know, those are really the two types of, of, of spurs that, that are in the book. And, and so maybe to give a, a more concrete example, we've been talking about the imagery ones. And so I'll talk about that too, because I think the imagery ones also, you know, because again, right away, as you're saying with the poem, you're forbidden to write, I just wanted to kind of lay it all out right at the start. 
And so one of the things that, that I also did then right at the start was, okay, we're talking about <clears throat> the image, the image in poetry. So of course we think imagery. And so when we first meet imagery in that section, it's draw in your senses. And then, so every, every no matter how, who you are as a poet, cons- the most conservative poet, that's yes, this is where we, this is where we start. And then the next, the next prompt leads people to explore the symbolic power of imagery. Okay, yeah. And then it's the third that gets into this more abstract, the kind of ideal image. That's another type of image we work at. And now that I've sort of brought everyone kind of safely along, then I can make that turn at the end of that section and be like, but actual physical images as well, both in terms of ekphrastic poetry, writing about works of art, or also having poems that respond to images on the page, work images into the page, or use the image to reshape the very layout of the poem or the very shape of the page. And so that, that, that was one thing that I was trying to do was to start somewhere accepted and comfortable and use that to show it is, it's not a strange leap to suddenly make poems that look like comics, you know, to, to use the example you gave that this is all a part of the same continuum of poets exploring, uh, exploring images. Um, so yeah, then it, in actually writing those writing moments, um, that was definitely where I could, I found myself, like when I go back and forth with my editor that she, she was having to do work to either, there's not enough kind of hands on going on here, or you've just gotten so convoluted. You have basically just given someone like a recipe, you, sure. you know what I mean? Like they're not even being prompted. They're just sort of like automatically and you know there are a few in there like that because i did want to i did want to play with that idea of, of, of the recipe as well that ine- inevitably people are going to tweak but but uh, yeah that was definitely something so what strikes me about that description of how you're kind of i guess say like layering one exercise or writing moment on the other is it's very much the structure that you'll see in a poem you know what <laughs> this stanza you know yeah it builds on the previous stanza, but develops it a bit more broadly or abstractly. You start from a, often a concrete place and move out to this broader, more abstract place, but then tie it together again with another almost epiphanic concrete image. Uh, so I was wondering to what degree you were intentionally doing that or modeling that building process uh, with these writing exercises, or to what degree do you think it's just you know, maybe a natural way your mind works? Yeah, I mean, I think it was just, it just seemed to me the most kind of, it seemed the most pedagogically sound and it just seemed to me like that was the, that was the best way to, to then really get at in a short span, you know, that first section on image is whatever, 15 pages, maybe even less. So right then you could take someone really through the kind of history of poetry, you know, of all of the sort from the most sort of traditional in my body, writing about my senses to a more kind of experimental approach. So to kind of just disconnect from the book for a second and talk more about these writing exercises and writing practice, which is something you get into more later towards the end of the book. Uh, but one question that I have is often we're encountering these writing exercises in the context of a creative writing classroom or, of course, in a writing textbook. Uh, and I'm wondering what value you think uh, writing exercises hold for non-beginner writers, like for people who are let's say, have published books out. You know, people who see themselves as maybe, you know, being past the point of taking a class in creative writing, rightly or wrongly. Uh, Yeah. But, um, again, like what, maybe they have actual projects they're working on. Like, to what degree are these writing exercises a distraction? And to what degree do you see them as, you know, kind of fundamental or integral or just a value to a non-beginner writer? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I think the obvious answer is one answer, and it's just that I think it can, that it can push you in new directions, you know what I mean? That it can, it can uh, maybe get you writing or, or, or writing in a way you wouldn't necessarily or think, you know, writing about new things, you know, all, all, all the things that come with that. Um, but of course, you know, a writer might respond to that and say, well, that's just why I read other writers. <laughs> fair, you know, sure. fair, fair enough. Um, but I, you know, I will say like a lot of the people, again, these are writing teachers, but a, a lot of people who've been getting desk copies or, or teaching from the book, I've been getting a lot of nice feedback from people, not only saying that they're enjoying teaching the book, but also they're like, Hey, yeah, I've been writing some new poems and that they found that, that it has been something that, uh, that, that, that is working and, and sending them in a, in a, in a new direction. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've certainly found it interesting. I, I'm kind of you know, in terms of poetry, I don't write a lot of poetry anymore. It's a real misperception people have about me. Uh, I don't really consider myself much of a poet. 
or <laughs> or that I really write poetry. Like you know, and I'll even point to the poetry books I've published and, and argue that they're not poetry in various right. ways. But um, <laughs> uh, I, I have made a sort of conscious decision with to go and like write some really classic poetic forms in particular yeah. traditional ways, and which I haven't really, I haven't published really. I mean, I've done sonnets and things, but they've never shown up in my books and so on. So what I find like at the moment, for example, I'm writing a Sestina about Leatherface from the huh, Texas nice. Chainsaw Massacre. So, I mean, I want it to have uh, a lot of these traditional aspects. Uh, so I found the book was just a good refresher in that sense. But also um, there were really particular exercises that uh, I don't know if they would really help me write this poem exactly, but I think they would kind of get me more into the space to write the poem, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like, like I've been finding it valuable even as in some ways a distraction from a project, yeah. you know, because there's a sort of weird way you can work as a writer. It's unfortunate in some respects, but you can be doing all this work and activity and on one hand, not be doing the thing you have to do, but on the other hand, almost have to do it in yeah. order to do that thing. Yeah. Um, so, so, so. I guess kind of a related question here is like, do you actually do rec writing exercises like this yourself? Like, would you pick up a book like this book or, or do you have like these exercises? Do you pick them up and just do them? Yeah. I mean, well, you know, the, the one thing that you've already that hit on is, you know, a lot of the exercises are just coming from either, you know, it was, it was fun to write this book because the one thing was writing Paul or, or drawing exercises from poems that I have written or types of poems that I write. So it's like, my chance to say, hey, here's a type of, you know, especially with kind of more experimental kind of hybrid poetry. Now I can show people, hey, here's how you can do it. And here's how it's not so different than what's, what's what we've already been doing. Um, but it was also a chance because I would have ideas uh, uh, for poems, I think. But, but I, you know, you don't have time to write all the poems you want. So suddenly you could sort of like put the seeds in there in the form of an exercise and have someone, hey, maybe at least someone else can can write that poem. But yeah, I... Uh, I, I was doing uh, uh, a very basic introduction to just the idea of occasional poetry in 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 my uh, in my creative writing class. But I was just thinking too how much the students are into like speculative literature and fantasy and all sorts of things like this. And so I thought instead of assigning them, I, I show them here's here's occasional poetry. But instead, I gave them the, the, the just the you know basic prompt. Instead, write a, a fake occasional poem or a false occasional poem, which I call, you know, vocational poems, like F-A-U-X. Yeah, and and sometimes, you know, in the classroom, if, if, if people are kind of taking care of themselves, I'll just start writing my own poem as well with them. So, so you know, I can, I can throw my, my piece out there. And I actually ended up writing more of these fake occasional or, or, or vocational poems. And that's actually my next book. Oh, there you go. That's coming out next fall. That's so great. that's... That's definitely that an exercise can take you in this direction that I never would have thought to have gone in a million years. I find that so often the weird case where you'll have a very strict idea of like what you want to do as a project, yeah. and but then actually something else will catch your eye randomly, and that yeah, will be what you do. Totally. Like, I wrote clock for that way. I just had this sudden image of like a clock on fire, wow. and I just extrapolated out from yeah. you know that image. Um, which actually doesn't appear in clock art. It's suggested yeah. that it will appear later. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, it never is described. And um, then anyway, I kind of hit on this weird idea of, oh, well, these impossible plays. And, you know, it just kind of like starts barreling out from that point. And so I found like, it wasn't exactly a writing exercise, but it was very much this kind of throwaway thing that I had done, which almost unchanged, like except for two sort of major sort of elements. It, almost the first draft unchanged huh. ended up in the book and then everything else was, you know, very much centered around the concept of that piece. Yeah. But it was like this weird, um, again, it was, you know, sitting in a classroom, you know, uh, thinking about some other thing that wasn't yeah. under discussion and just you know, this sort of thing comes in your head and then you're, you're off to the races in a weird way. Yeah. Um, but kind of along those, one other thing that I think is valuable in this book, uh, you know, you don't spend a ton of time on it, but you do get into something I've never actually seen uh, or even really thought about weirdly, which is doing an outline for a poem. Like if you have yeah. an idea, but you don't have time to write this poem, yeah. make an outline of the poem. I mean, I, it never even occurred to me to do that, which seems so obvious. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Now that I see it. And, um, and, and that idea, I, I really appreciate that sort of idea as well. Uh, and so... One thing I'm kind of related to that that I was wondering about was, 
say you you know somebody has done an exercise uh, either just because they want to experiment with a particular different way of doing things or you know they're in a writing classroom or or whatever for any reason they're compelled to do an exercise but and you're so often in these exercises you're producing things that aren't poems but are like yeah. just little fragments or, or what have you um maybe you just craft a particular metaphor or image yeah it's not but it's outside the context of being in a poem like what are some strategies uh, that you would suggest for actually moving from uh one like how do you how would you suggest a writer think about an exercise in terms of whether or not uh, like what in that exercise would maybe compel somebody to move towards an actual draft? Uh, and then two, like what are a couple strategies for moving from like a very fragmentary piece uh, to a fuller draft? Like in some ways that's what your whole book is about, but uh, I'm wondering, you know, uh, if you have some particular tips or strategies you'd like to suggest to writers who maybe have this, just this fragment of an idea, but don't um, maybe know where to go to get it fleshed out in a, in a manner of speaking? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, that's a great question. It, 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 it's a hard question because that's broad. definitely one of those things that, yeah, and I think varies so much poet to poet on, on sort of like finding what your kind of patterns are for bringing this, you know, to bringing this to fruition. But I, I know for sure one of the things that, that uh, I, I do encounter is, yeah, it's just this idea of like, what, 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 yeah, what, what's, what's, what's worth keeping? Yeah. Or, or, or sort of like, where, where do we go for the, for the people who are just learning these sort of forms? One of the exercises I do in class actually is to give a prompt, uh, you know, give a little writing moment and, 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 and people write it, write it, write it, try to write as much as a kind of short poem as they can to finish. And then whoever wants to share, we go around and share. And then we pick one as a class. And then I, you know, have the little projection camera. We put that one up on there on the screen so everyone can see this person's draft. And now this is our sort of group poem that we're all going to share and, and write something kind of from this. And so I talk about, like, what for you is that kind of, like, gem of a line? Which is that line that hits you is, like, if all this is thrown out, this one line has to be saved. And, and is it a, is it a voice that you grow out of that? Is it an extended metaphor? Is it some kind of image? So that's one thing that, that, that people can do. Another, another option I give them is to sort of find, uh, a kind of structure in the poem, potentially sort of turn it, you know, yeah. play with the order of kind of, kind of what's already there. So that, that's an, another technique and just talk about a few things that way. And then, cause that's always a fun exercise because then everyone's worked from that same source and even work from the strange, same strategies. And then hearing that you can hear, Oh, well that's a way to go. I could have, you know, giving people another thing I might do there is giving people sort of structural shapes, Sure. you know, give it a kind of linear progression, give it a radial uh, shape, give it, give it juxtaposing, like using these, you know, giving verbs, make the poem run, make the poem fly. And just using that as a way of giving it that. Yeah. Cause it's definitely something that, that, you, you know, you can, you, that, that, that you can see people struggle with beginner writers finding these shapes and advanced writers not using your same two or three formulas that you've caught yourself yeah. suddenly using in the last 75 poems you've written. On that note, what, one sort of thing that I wanted to ask you a bit more about, you touched on this really briefly in the book, but uh, there is this common um, idea that writers need to find their voice or find their style. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what you think of that and to what degree these writing exercises can either one help with that or two help you avoid that. If that question makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I think that writing exercise, because on the one hand, you know, for me, in terms of um, types of poetry, like I definitely tend to be a kind of everything -ist. you know what I mean? Like, I think a poet should be able to do everything. And, and I mean that in two ways. Like one, you should be able to do everything. Like you should be able to write like a, a Shakespearean sonnet. You should be able to write a Sistine. You should be able to write all these forms. But you, you should also be able to, create a structure in such a way that, yeah, maybe like throwing a trace of water across a rock and, and <laughs> snapping a photo or not, you know what I mean? Or, you know, but that you should be able to think of that and work that a, a, as poetry. So, so on the one hand, yeah, I'm definitely uh, uh, ha have that approach of, of exercises as just being a way of 
of adding more dimensions uh, to, to that, that larger kind of choral voice that, that really we, we all have in us. Stephen King has a book where he talks about, you know, having this toolbox, like a writing toolbox. So I, I often think exercise in that way. You, you develop a tool throughing your toolbox, maybe you use it later, maybe you don't. I mean, okay. and it, but it all depends. What I like about his metaphor is you, 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 you he has, tells a little story of how his grandfather, I forget who it was, his uncle or grandfather went to go fix a screen door. Um, and he, you know, brings this big honk and toolbox over, puts it down, um, there's, takes one tool out of it, uh, fixes the thing and then puts the tool back. And then yeah. King asks him, well, why did you bring the whole toolbox if, you know, you only need this one tool? And he says, well, you know, once I was here, yeah. I might have discovered I needed some other, there was some other job to do, or, or I had some other, you know, uh, thing that I might need, you know, so, and I like that metaphor of having to kind of carry this toolbox around. Because what I find so often, and this is something, at certain moments you kind of touch on this, but what I find so often with students or even with, you know, really world-class professional writers where they start to falter or fail is if they are taking a sort of inappropriate style and trying to apply it to an idea. So it's something that they've had success with in the past, or it's just something that they maybe unconsciously think they have to do. Yeah. You know, that's what poetry is. Or again, you know, this is what I do. Uh, yeah. And suddenly you have an idea that it doesn't serve. So you, and I feel this is the problem that a lot of uh, great writers fall into when um, they start to produce bad work is they they often have seized an idea that, you know, maybe is excellent, but it does, it does not, it's not served by their style. And yet yeah. they've yeah. developed this voice and the style and they're trying now consciously or unconsciously they're applying it across to every idea yeah in some ways that's a trap a success trap that writers yeah. can get into but i think it's also a thing that um many you know kind of beginning or emerging whatever you want to call them writers get into almost by accident because it's very it's you know especially if you have a particular maybe political idea of what you think writing is or should be yeah if that makes sense uh and what I've found useful in one way I've managed hopefully to avoid uh, <laughs> that kind of a trap, I guess it depends who you talk to, you know, whether, whether I avoid it or not. But uh, like what I find myself doing a lot is mimicking tech, like experimental approaches, but not actually doing them. Yeah. So I'll often produce poems that ever, people assume have been written under some conceptual or procedural constraint, but they haven't been. Yeah, uh, I've just started. I've just learned how to mimic that style, um, and so uh, in some ways, you know, there's reasons not to do that and to yeah. actually be more procedural and conceptual. Uh, and but I think you know, one way to kind of escape the various traps you can find yourself in as a writer is to to be doing these sorts of exercises, either you know because you want to try something new or just again kind of kick you yourself out of. The habit of doing the same thing over and over. Absolutely, because yeah. you can be very successful doing that in a, both creatively and you know in other respects sometimes. And uh, but then if you get that idea that doesn't work, you know it just doesn't work for it. Now you're stuck, and you'll often be miserable. Yeah. Um, or you'll feel there's a problem, but you won't know what the problem is. And yeah. to some degree, I find like especially if, I find a lot of writers when I talk to them about what they're trying to do, they'll have this you know very clear idea, but They'll have just picked some form or structure that makes it makes zero sense to use. Yeah, huh, um, interesting. For whatever reason, you know, like they'll have, uh, and that's and maybe they're just used to applying that, or they just have had the idea they wanted to write a sonnet, but then they started, I don't know, producing something that would have. It just doesn't make sense to write a, in yeah. a sonnet form for some reason yeah. or other. Um, I see it more common with haikus, weirdly. Where, um, yeah, I don't know why, but yeah. Um, so just. Talking about you as a teacher, um, I'm wondering if you found, now that you have a textbook out, <laughs> you know, what has your experience been like using this book in a classroom? And, and have you found any kind of unexpected ways to use it in the classroom? Maybe? Like things, obviously there's things you were intending to, you know, hoping to do. Yeah. Uh, but w in what ways did you, have you found it maybe surprisingly useful <laughs> or well i mean really one of the one of the things that I, I mean this just shows me maybe not thinking enough about it but one of the things that surprised me and and that i've loved about it is is just getting all that material into the into the hands of the students because 
of course, this is all stuff that I would always love to, that, 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 that we would cover and we'd be able to talk about. But of course, each class would just be a little fraction unless I would be giving, you know, 20, 25 page handouts. And so now I'm able to assign a little bit of a section to read. So they come, they come to class or, and we talk about it or they go away after having talked about it in class and read more. And so now instead of us talking about a little bit of what would be in a, in a section there and then me assigning one writing exercise, they're now able to read through it all and then pick from, you know, all the, the, the four writing moments or the six or seven writing exercises. And so it's been neat watching people be able to craft their own kind of path through the book. You know, like having students who will find their will will, will find the way of uh, hey, like I I, I want to be more of an experimental poet, and so they'll they'll gravitate towards those, and 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 so you know they're still having to do some of the more traditional stuff, but they're also able to be like, whoa, what's a sound poem? I've never heard of a sound poem, and they're you know re following all the links that I give them and and trying their hand at that, and and so I'm definitely like that that they have all this material and they're able to have. I guess a bit more ownership over it rather than me. I, I, I mean, I still am the gatekeeper, I guess, because I, yeah. I put this stuff in the book, but rather than me just pointing to these few things, they're able to kind of go, go with it on their own. And have you found, um, have you found that, it, this may be your question, but have you found it to be a problem in any way? Like, has it like sucked your lectures away from you or, or otherwise, you know, has it just been, a, has it freed you up in the it class? Has freed, or yeah, is it definitely. Yeah, so I am able to say like, Oh, this these two things we didn't get to. You can go to page, you know, eighteen and twenty-two, and, and make sure you check that out. Or if you're interested in more of this, because I've the books I use the book in such a way that I use part of it for the the beginner level, and then I use part of it for the intermediate level, and so they end up not, you know, they don't read the whole book in in, in the one class, um, and there's still stuff that that we don't quite get to. Um, one of the one of the the I guess another kind of unexpected thing that was fun that came out of it was since the students then were reading so many writing exercises and things like that, I said, okay, for next class, this is the intermediate class, I said, write your own writing moments. Like, write something in that style and that, that sort of maybe not covered in the book or that you think should be covered in a new way. And I, I kind of almost wish I hadn't done that because I was like, damn, these are good. <laughs> you might, you, yeah, you might not now. need me anymore. You all just get this book and then make your own exercises. And, and then so we did those and then they handed them around and they each wrote poems off their own prompts and I wrote a poem off, off one of the prompts. And so that was definitely something unexpected too was seeing them take that step towards being the, being the instructor as well. Yeah, I, I haven't used the book yet. And I'm going to use it next term in, my, in a classroom, but uh, I'm very, you know, looking forward to it because especially for poetry, like I say, I find it's just so hard to find a book. Uh, yeah. I don't know why it's so hard to find writing textbooks because there's so many of them. Yeah. But so many of them are one focus on fiction or two, again, have some weird political agenda or some, or just lack any sort of diversity for some reason. Or, yeah. as I say, you know, they, they are too basic. And I feel that's a real problem, oddly, even for beginners. Yeah. Because I just don't see what benefit they get from a book, you know. Absolutely, Frankly, yeah. Like, yeah. You know, like I'll see whole chapters sometimes devoted to how you shouldn't use adverbs. Well, that's like five words or something. You know, yeah. like it's like a sentence. Don't use adverbs for the yeah. following reasons. <laughs> you know, and then you might tag two more sentences on there. Yeah. Um, and then ignoring all the times you would use an adverb. Um, or again, like the reasons in more detail uh, and like realistically like I find like if you just give people a checklist of like 10 things that they can just do yeah they immediately improve uh, yeah. and then you can kind of go somewhere else after that point totally um, if you I often tell students like you know if you just go through your writing and do like you know a handful of really technical things you can just instantly improve it yeah uh, and then we can kind of get into maybe you know what else you can do to like improve at a more broader animal, you know, yeah. level. And then you can go back and just subvert all that stuff, you know, yeah. that you had kind of taken as straightforward rules, like all the quote unquote rules of writing. Yeah. One, of course, you know, there's this way in which they do help. Uh, but, you know, eventually you can come back and subvert them. Yeah. But two, there's this way in which, you know, at the moment that they truly help, it truly helps to just accept without question particular, you know, rules like, you know, avoid your passive voice, avoid, you know, yeah. abstract verbs and so on. 
at that moment, you don't need the explanation and you don't need to read yeah. a whole book about it. <laughs> yes. Do you sure. know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's such a weird sort of, and so you get these books that are basically checklists, uh, I feel. And I don't see why when you talk endlessly about something like at, at the checklist level. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, uh, I, I, and just from talking to writers and knowing writers, you know, at, at the level where you start to become more confident or, you know, you're writing publishable work, mm. um, you know, those writers aren't thinking in terms of writing rules. Yeah. You know, they they may have certain things that they do consistently or that they believe, you know, make for good writing or even that they tell students, but on their, their bookshelves are, you know, books unlike theirs, yeah. uh, books of philosophy, yeah. you know, books of, you know, general interest, non, you know, it's all sorts of things that we don't necessarily, like you, you were talking about comic books, you know, like you've got your poetry and then you've got all this other stuff. Yeah, uh, sitting on the shelf behind you, and I feel like a lot of writing books focus on like, like if they're teaching fiction, they'll be you know talking about if they're, like if they're teaching short stories. It's like go buy some short story books, go read a bunch of short stories. Yes, that's great, but you know why? Uh, and like, why wouldn't you go pick up a book by Zizek? Yeah, uh, and, and you know apply that, and, or yeah. just completely fail to apply it. But, um, you know, wrestle with or even contend against those ideas in some way. Um, so there's a lot of sort of weird, I, I mean, my, from my perspective, there's a lot of kind of myths about what's useful to a writer um, yeah. at various stages. And then there's this way that, you know, what I would like to call kind of non-beginner or serious writers, whether they are really beginning or not, you know, there's a kind of a difference often between like the very serious students you can tell are going to keep writing yeah. Uh, and the people who, you know, just are going to quit for some reason or other, uh, either after they publish a book, which happens a lot, yeah. uh, or, you know, before. And it's not that those people, that, you know, aren't making good decisions or can't be served, but I, I feel like there's this lack of serving writers, you know, who've got books out and, you know, maybe, you're, you know, are like you, like, where's the book for you. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> because I'm sure you'd want to read it, you know? Yeah. Um, so kind of, this is a broader question disconnected a bit, but I'm wondering just what you think are some of the kind of core myths that writers believe. Is that, this is a very abstract question, but. Um, I mean, maybe this one's too this one's probably too broad and, and perhaps, you know, it's inevitably a very personal question. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I think for me, and this is something I've, I've been thinking about a lot for a while, I won't even say lately, for a while, and it's just that it's kind of a twofold problem, and it's on the one hand, it's that what, what, what we do as poets say, it doesn't matter, you should be apologetic, when you stand up at the mic, you should be bowing your head about not make, make crack jokes about not making any money, da da da. You should do that because we're just worthless. So there's that side of it. But then, kind of weirdly connected to it, is this obsession with the things that don't matter, as though that's the award, the nomination, or this, or who's re do, reviewing that, or da da da. So there's on the one hand the sense of like, and, and I'm saying this not judging anyone, it's like putting it on me. Just like, oh, I'm a poet. I, I don't make any money off my poetry. And like, oh, the nominee. You, who, oh, is your book going to get, whose book is it? Da, da, da. And it's like, I think for me, that, that's something that, that is, is a kind of myth that, that, that I feel like, I feel like I'm thinking about it more because I'm really ex living through it. Like, like, like getting, you know what I mean? Like I'm feeling like, you know, two things have happened. One, you know, a, a lot of it is just teaching, you know, of just like, how important the process is and how awesome the process is and how amazing writing poems is and sharing poems with other people are writing poems. And it's just like, you know, when, once you, you see that angle, then you're like, no, I'm not apologetic because this is amazing. Like, this is awesome. Everyone out there is not doing it. You should be doing what we're doing. And then there's also just the forget all this awards or forget who's getting mad at who on Twitter. Or like, it doesn't matter. But you know what I mean? Like, and, and one of the things that really brought it kind of clear to me was at Christmas, uh, my girlfriend and I 
We're visiting your dad in Florida, and he's a real, uh, I mean, he, he's, he was in real estate, and he now runs kind of senior, senior care stuff, so he's a real businessman, but he's always loved movies, he's always loved reading, he's got a huge bookshelf, and, and so he's a real fan of the arts at the same time, and, and, and we were watching a movie with him, I can't remember what it was, and uh, Andrea, she said something to me, and then I kind of said something back, and we're kind of talking at the level of craft, and he was just, what did you two just say, like, what? It's like, wow. And then we kind of explained it to him. And it's stuff that, you know, we would just, this is just how we think about this stuff. And he's like, you two have such a gift. Like, you are so lucky that you can see that and that, and that you have the opportunity to show people that. And I just thought, wow, like, I'm such a jerk. You know, I'm such a, you know what I mean? Like, and, and so that's a moment that really, really stuck with me. So the, the only kind of other question I really wanted to ask you was, you know, is there such a thing as caffeinated bread? Like at one point in this book, you, you make some often remark to, you know, it's the best thing since caffeinated bread. And like, is that real? Like I think it bread? is. Really? I do. I th I don't think I was making that up. That's like a million, that's a million dollar idea. As soon as I saw <laughs> that, I was like, not only is that a beautiful poetic <laughs> image <laughs> or some sort of, you know, but, it, but, it, you know, that's, that's a brilliant million dollar idea. Wow. Well, hopefully, maybe it's not real. And does this, I don't know, is publishing it count as like having <laughs> the copy or caught trademark? Can't copyright on it? ideas. <laughs> no, that's, uh, yeah, that, that was a revelation to me. There's all sorts of little weird gems in there. I don't know uh, if that really is one, but it's certainly, you know, a brilliant, <laughs> brilliant image. Uh, but yeah, well, well, thanks so much, uh, Daniel. I really appreciate it. And, um, I'm excited to you know to know more about this uh, this book of yours coming out. You said it was this fall or next fall? Uh, next, yeah. So it's I guess uh, this fall 2015. Over, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's excellent. Well, Sweet. what's the book called? Do you have a clear title? Yeah. Yet? So I am I am going to stick with the title. So you know, these fake occasional. So it's called Focational Poems. Okay, great. Focational. It starts at it's it goes it moves in kind of chronological order from year zero and then ends again at future year zero. So oh, excellent. And there you go. You know, a book. Born out of writing moments. Uh, yeah, <laughs> hopefully it's good. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks so much. Well, thank uh, you very much, Jonathan. This is a lot of fun. Great. Well, uh, talk to you later.